If it's Tuesday, Attorney General Merrick Garland speaks to NBC News as new details emerge about the Justice Department's investigation into those responsible for the January 6th attack against the Capitol. The latest on the legal and political drama in just a moment. Plus, former President Trump and former Vice President Pence return to Washington with two very different messages about the future of their party, what they said and why it matters ahead. And later, President Biden tries to downplay recession fears as consumer confidence drops again ahead of another expected hike in interest rates tomorrow. Welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. For the first time since January 2021, both Donald Trump and Mike Pence are back in Washington, D.C. They return with very different visions for the future of their party and amid an escalating Justice Department investigation into the January 6th insurrection, which now appears to have worked its way all the way up to the Trump White House. As NBC News and other news organizations first reported, Pence's former chief of staff, Mark Short, has appeared before a federal grand jury investigating the January 6th attack. He was one of the aides with Pence in the Capitol during the insurrection. Now, Short is the highest ranking administration official known to date to appear before the Justice Department's grand jury. And his testimony could be an indication that the criminal probe is moving beyond just investigating the violence at the Capitol. NBC's Lester Holt sat down with Attorney General Merrick Garland just this afternoon, who said their probe is looking into, quote, any attempt to interfere with the lawful transfer of power. Take a listen to their exchange. You said in no uncertain terms the other day that no one is above the law. Yeah. That said, um, the indictment of a former president, of a perhaps candidate for president, would arguably tear the country apart. Is that your concern as you make your decision down the road here? Do you have to think about things like that? Look, we pursue justice without fear or favor. We intend to hold everyone, anyone, who was criminally responsible for the events surrounding January 6th, for any attempt to interfere with the lawful transfer of power from one administration to another, accountable. That's what we do. We don't pay any attention to other uh, issues with respect to that. So if Donald Trump were to become a candidate for president again, that would not change your schedule or, or how you move forward or don't move forward? Uh, I'll say again that uh, we will hold accountable anyone who is criminally responsible for attempting to interfere with the transfer, legitimate lawful transfer of power from one administration to the next. Significant soundbite there from the attorney general. There are also reports that Pence's former counsel, Greg Jacob, has also appeared before a grand jury as well. Now, remember, both Short and Jacob were key witnesses in the House Select Committee's recent hearings as it laid out the former president's attempts to pressure Pence to stop the certification of the election on January 6th. In his remarks in Washington today, Mr. Pence laid out his agenda for the party while taking a not-so-veiled attack on Mr. Trump's focus on the 2020 election and score settling. Now, some people may choose to focus on the past, but elections are about the future. And I believe conservatives must focus on the future to win back America. We can't afford to take our eyes off the road in front of us. Because what's at stake is the very survival. Of our Former President Trump is speaking right now down the street from here. So far, he has largely focused his remarks on criticizing Democrats on the issue of crime. We're still monitoring that. NBC's Von Hilliard is following President Trump and Vice President Pence. Also with us is NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee, NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian, and former federal prosecutor and NBC News legal analyst Joyce Vance. Thanks to all of you for joining me on this Tuesday. Vaughn, I want to start with you. You are there where former President Trump is speaking. You've been tracking former Vice President Mike Pence as well. You've been covering them, obviously, for a long time. Talk about the contrasts in their messaging that we heard today and what your takeaways are. Yeah, good afternoon, Kristen. Uh, the former president has been up on stage for about to half an hour at this point here. 
ahead of his address that he was going to focus Vaughn, on. Vaughn, we are having trouble hearing you. In the United States. Uh, now we hear you. Go ahead. All righty. For about the last half hour, the former president has been talking about this idea of crime in the United States. And an aide told us before this speech that he intended to focus on crime in the United States here. And you know, for the last 30 minutes, that's exactly what the former president has done. And there's a lot of layers that we could work through in just the 30 minutes of remarks right now, in which he has suggested that, you know, essentially the federal government should circumvent governors to go into cities and to rid them of crime as well as the homeless population. Again, this is scant on details and we could work through this a lot more. But today's arrival of him here to Washington, D.C. is notable because it's the first time that he has been back in Washington, D.C. since leaving on the day that Joe Biden was sworn in, January 20th, 2021. And it's also marked because earlier this morning, the former Vice President Mike Pence delivered a speech just one mile down the road from where we are right now. And in that speech, the former Vice President focused heavily that Republicans should be looking towards the future, providing ideas and optimism in which voters can rally behind in 2022 and beyond, and so that the party needs to move beyond in his his word was, quote, complaining about the past here. And, uh, you know, I should note here now the former president has not so far noted in the last half hour any aspect of any of the investigations into him and instead has so far focused on this one policy aspect. Of course, the former president is not somebody who stick, typically sticks the teleprompter throughout the whole speech. And it would be surprising if he did not comment on the investigations that are centered around him right now. Kristen. Yeah. And, Vaughn, one of the hardest things we have to do as reporters is speak in the middle of someone else's speech. Very well done. Thank you for that. Live update in real time. Really appreciate it. Carol, let me go to you now and get you to weigh in on this contrast in messaging that we are hearing not only from former President Trump and former Vice President Mike Pence, but what we all saw at the White House yesterday, which is that President Biden, who is recovering from COVID, did something that he rarely does, Carol, which is to not only take aim at his predecessor, but to talk about the issue of January 6th, we, we went into our fine files and found that the last time he did that was actually the anniversary of January 6th. What did you make of that, that strategy from President Biden? Do you think we're going to see a lot more of that from the president? Yeah, Kristen, I think we will see more of that from President Biden. What the White House has said literally from the day President Biden took office is that he would choose his moments to weigh in on, A, just on his, predece his predecessor, but also just on January 6th itself. It's something the White House has tried to keep a little bit of distance from, but the president has taken moments where he's leaned in on that issue. And we know from our own reporting that he's even considering giving a big speech about January 6th once the committee wraps up its work, potentially even as it, after it finishes that possible preliminary report. And what we saw yesterday was a little bit of that. And we're getting closer to the midterm elections. The president's ramping up in terms of what his campaign rhetoric might be. And January 6th, we're told, is going to be part of that. So it's how the president is trying to frame Republicans, both former President Trump and others who support him as extremists. And what we heard from him yesterday was remarkable in that he did this from the White House. He did this to a group of law enforcement, which is interesting given what Vaughn was just talking about, that the former president is also addressing issues like crime and things like that in his remarks. And the pr President Biden's message was that, that President Trump was essentially a hypocrite, that he would, didn't do anything on January 6th as law enforcement was under attack. The other interesting thing that he did, Kristen, was he used his actual name. And I know that mm. that might seem silly to, to people. Why does that matter? But it's a very strategic thing when you're from this White House. Usually he refers to him as the former defeated president. And he did do that yesterday. But he also said Donald Trump. And he said Donald Trump was a coward or acted cowardly. And so you really see him stepping up this rhetoric as former President Trump is returning to Washington giving his own speech. And so I think you'll see more of what President Biden had to say as he gets out on the campaign trail more. I'm so glad you bring that up, Carol, because it, it was a small detail, but a very large detail in terms of what it signified. I do want to play a little bit of what we heard from President Biden yesterday. And then, Carol, I'm going to ask you a follow up on the other side. This was President Biden speaking from the White House virtually to a law enforcement organization. Take a listen. The police were heroes that day. 
Donald Trump lacked the courage to act. The brave women and men in blue all across this nation should never forget that. You can't be pro-insurrection and pro-cop. You can't be pro-insurrection and pro-democracy. You can't be pro-insurrection and pro-American. Carol, this was a feisty speech, as you just detailed all of the reasons why. Um, and it sure sounded like he's gearing up to be a candidate in 2024. And yet, and yet, you've been talking to sources, I've been talking to sources who are questioning whether he's the best person to take on the mantle of the Democratic Party. Quinnipiac poll had 54 percent of Democrats saying they don't want President Biden to run again. What are your sources telling you inside the White House about the president's mindset right now? Well, look, this, inside the White House, people close to the president say that he is running, that all systems are a go towards possibly announcing or at least filing the paperwork for his reelection shortly after the new year. So having a conversation with his family over the holidays and then filing for reelection. So that's what you hear officially from the White House. There are others who are Biden supporters who say, just wait and see. We don't know where things are going to be in six months. But so the president is really battling this perception from with own his own, within his own party that he might not be a viable candidate. And what you hear from him, according to our reporting, is that he tells people, he goes through the list of all the possible other Democratic candidates and says which one could beat Trump. So taking on Trump is also an imperative for President Biden because the idea that he can beat Trump is the whole reason for his campaign, according mm. to him and people close to him. Yeah, it, great reporting, Carol. Kendalini, let me turn to you because the backdrop to all of this is the January 6th investigation, but also what's happening inside the DOJ. And our Lester Holt sat down with the Attorney General today. We played that soundbite at the top, but again, just to underscore, the Attorney General told Lester that their probe is looking into, quote, any attempt to interfere with the lawful transfer of power. When you read between the lines, what do you make of what we heard from the Attorney General? My sense of that, that felt to me like a slightly more expansive view of the investigation than Garland has expressed before. Obviously, they're investigating the people who attacked the Capitol. They're, they've arrested as many as 900 of those people. We know that they're also arrest, uh, investigating the false elector scheme. But now you have Mark Short, the chief of staff of Vice President Pence, called before a federal grand jury. We've confirmed that. That is a major escalation, it appears, that's the highest ranking person inside the Trump White House that we know of who's testified. And Garland's elocution today, he's previously used that peaceful transfer of power phrase, but he's framed it in the sense of the attack on Congress. Mm. But as we know from all this uh, evidence that's been unearthed by the January 6th committee, Donald Trump engaged in a lot of activity that many legal experts say possibly was the criminal attempt to overturn the election that didn't have to do with attacking the Capitol. It had to do with the false elector scheme, with pressuring Mike Pence, with using the Justice Department to try to overturn the election. And that's what it felt like Merrick Garland was alluding to. And when you think about Mark Short testifying before the federal grand jury, you call it an escalation. And yet we don't know specifically whether it directly ties to former President Trump, right? That's right. We don't. For all we know, they could have just been asking him about the fake elector scheme, which mm. you know Mike Pence was targeted in that scheme in the sense that they were asking him to do something on January sixth that he wasn't willing to do. But look, Mark Short saw a lot, as mm -hmm. you know. I mean, he was not only he was in a meeting in the old in the in the White House where John Eastman, that Trump election lawyer, was trying to pressure Mike Pence to take action on January 6th to slow down the congressional certification. He was also with Mike Pence during the attack. So he may know about phone calls to Mike Pence or what Mike Pence was seeing and feeling and doing. So he's a crucial witness. And he also testified before the January 6th committee. Prosecutors have access to that testimony, yet they still wanted him before the grand jury. That's a very important point. Joyce, weigh in here. And if you could engage in some tea leaf reading First of all, your reaction to what we heard from Attorney General Merrick Garland, what do you make of that? I think the Attorney General was responding to some of the criticism that's been filtering across the country. From his point of view, I think the criticism would have been surprising because people who work at the Justice Department speak in a very restrained sort of language that is meant to never tip their hand too much. So when the Attorney General on January 5th talked about being willing to go after potential targets, whether they were present on January 6th or not, to him I suspect that would have signified this full range of conduct. 
but we heard him, as Ken said, expand that today to talk about, for instance, attempt, which is a crime. You don't have to actually complete an insurrection. Mm. You don't actually have to complete an interference with Congress to be charged. Just the attempt is enough, and the Attorney General is expanding uh, his public acknowledgement of what sort of conduct might come within his purview. And Ken talks about the fact that Mark Short was involved in all of these critical meetings, including one with John Eastman, in which he was trying to argue the case that there was a path to try to overturn the election. What do you make of Mark Short meeting with the grand jury. Do you think that that indicates a direct line to former President Trump as it relates to this, what may be an investigation going on inside the DOJ? Mark Short is a witness, perhaps he's the witness, to the pressure campaign against Vice President Trump. You can't really question Short without getting into the details of the pressure that the former president tried to bring to bear to get Mike Pence to subvert the certification of the election. So I think it's reasonable for us to act under the assumption that DOJ is at least looking at that conduct. That's clearly within the remit of what Merrick Garland has said he believes he can investigate. Um, the only surprise here in my mind is that this is happening so late. It's now 2022. We're almost at the midterms. The surprise to me is that this wasn't happening in March or April of 2021. And Joyce, just very quickly, because we're almost out of time, how does the political calendar, if in any way, way bear down on what may be an investigation by the Justice Department? The attorney general has said it doesn't and won't impact any investigation. But what do you make of that? I think he's correct. That's how DOJ operates. Although we might, although DOJ might shut down operations for a candidate on the ballot uh, in close proximity to the election, investigation continues to go forward. And just because you're on the ballot, that doesn't insulate you from criminal prosecution. All right. Well, a, a lot to unpack today. So thank you for getting us started. Joyce Vance, Ken Delanian, thank you both. And before that, of course, Vaughn Hilliard and Carol Lee at the White House. Fantastic reporting. And you can watch much more of Lester Holt's exclusive interview with Attorney General Merrick Garland. That is tonight on Nightly News. Coming up, testing former President Trump's power at the ballot box as some of the summer's most competitive primaries are now just one week away. That's next. Plus, flash floods and raging fires, an update on the severe record-breaking weather blasting through the U.S. You're watching Meet the Press Now. We're back after a quick break. Welcome back. The battle between the former president and his vice president continuing in Washington, D.C. today as both Donald Trump and Mike Pence try to chart the future of the Republican Party. While Donald Trump throws his weight behind candidates that support the lie that the 2020 election was stolen from him, Mike Pence wants the party to move past the 2020 election and instead keep the focus on the Biden administration's shortcomings as he argues them. Next week's primaries, particularly in Arizona, that governor's race there will give us the latest glimpse into which side of this proxy war is prevailing right now. I am joined now by Dave Wasserman, senior editor for the Cook Political Report. Dave, great to see you. Thanks for being here. Of course. Talk about what has been described as this proxy war between Trump and Pence. We're seeing it play out right now in Arizona in the gubernatorial race. Who do you think wins this? I mean, Trump has sort of had a mixed showing in terms of the candidates he's back so far. Yeah, Kerry Lake probably is ahead in the polls, and so it'd be a surprise if, if Pence's candidate does win. More broadly, you know, the fascinating thing about, about Trump's involvement in Republican primaries, obviously his first priority has been to purge the party of people who have crossed him, rather to expand Republicans' gains this fall. But his endorsement's been most influential in really crowded races where, you know, he's made a difference for J.D. Vance or Mehmet Oz, in races where there are well-established figures who are well-known statewide, uh, like Brad Little in Idaho or Brian Kemp in Georgia, it's made less of a difference. But in House races, I think we are really seeing a move towards the Trump wing of the party. I don't think Liz Cheney has a path to re-election in Wyoming, and I think Peter Meyer is probably going to lose his primary in Michigan next week. I'd be surprised if there are more than 
two pro-impeachment Republicans out of 10 who are members of Congress come next January. I want to ask you about the Peter Meyer race in just a moment, but, but before we get there, I mean, we are seeing what could potentially be a wave election, right? And I, I guess the question is, could some of these candidates just benefit from that? You have a Doug Mastriano, for example, in Pennsylvania, the gubernatorial candidate who several weeks ago, if you looked at the polls, he didn't really have a shot. Now you have Democrats propping him up, uh, not necessarily with cash, but they think he's the preferred candidate. Do you think that those types of candidates in a wave election come out on top? Look, Democrats aren't propping up Doug Mastriano now. He won the primary. So that that effort um, is, is now to destroy Doug Mastriano uh, from the Democrats. But uh, look, uh, there is a chance that some of these farther right um, election conspiracy believing candidates do win high profile contests. I think Pennsylvania is uniquely problematic for Republicans, not only because uh, Mastriano seems fixated on the 2020 results at a time when voters want to hear about the economy, but also because of Dr. Oz in the Senate race. In, in House races, that's where I think you really are going to see a movement towards more, uh, more Trump-esque or uh, election conspiracy embracing candidates as we see a purge of the traditional wing of the party. So let's go to the Peter Meyer race and John Gibbs. And, and Democrats are uh, try, you do see them propping up John Gibbs, who is, of course, the far right candidate there. I believe we have an ad to play. I want to play it and get your reaction on the other side. Oh, we do not have an ad. OK, but but talk about this strategy. How risky is it, do you think, for Democrats to engage in this type of strategy? Again, because we're in a potential wave election year. Well, if Democrats wake up in 2023 and wonder why there is no more resistance to Trump in the Republican Party, it's because they'll have beaten many of the people who were remaining uh, in, in the Republican Party trying to hold Trump accountable. And in Michigan's third district, it's a fascinating race mm -hmm. because you do have a Democratic opportunity. And most of these primaries that feature Trump versus, uh, versus Trump skeptics uh, don't play out in swing districts. Liz Cheney, Wyoming, that's not a race Democrats are ever going to win. Michigan 3 is. They do have a top-tier candidate in attorney Hillary Skolton, who came within six points of Peter Meyer in 2020. Democrats are calculating that if they beat Meyer in the primary, and by the way, I think Meyer would be the underdog regardless of mm. what Democrats do to meddle, then I, I believe Skolton does become the favorite to flip that Grand Rapids seat that's trending blue. Let me ask you about your overall predictions. You recently downgraded your expectations in the House from a GOP gain of between 20 to 35 to a GOP gain of 15 to 30. So talk about this. What went into your decision? Yeah, I don't think we're seeing this red wave ebb that much. Mm -hmm. But what it what has changed since Dobbs is that you have a number of Republican primaries that are polling Republican candidates to the right. And a number of them have taken positions in favor of flat bans on abortion. For example, John Gibbs in Michigan recently told the Detroit News that he believes that many great Americans were actually conceived by rape. He favors a flat ban on abortion. Democrats are going to exploit that, and it could save suburban Democratic House incumbents in a number of races, like in the Kansas City or Minneapolis suburbs. So I do think that that could mitigate the losses that Democrats suffer, even though Republicans are still the heavy favorites to regain control of the House. All right, Dave Wasserman, always so fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Well, there was devastating flooding in Missouri today after a record eight and a half inches of rain sent water levels soaring overnight, triggering flash floods. Video from earlier today shows cars in St. Louis almost submerged underwater. At least six people and six dogs had to be rescued from their homes. That's according to the city's fire department. Some roads remain closed and some of the city's public transit is also unusable with railway platforms under the waterline. Meanwhile, out west, the fire near California's Yosemite National Park is still raging. It's spread over 18,000 acres since Friday. The Oak Fire is the largest of California's wildfire seasons. So far, California Governor Gavin Newsom has declared a state of emergency in the area, and thousands of residents were forced to evacuate. The fire is now 26% contained as firefighters battle high heat 
and steep terrain. We'll continue to watch both those stories. Coming up next, money meddling and the battle for party control with just over 100 days until the midterms. We'll look at all of it. You're watching Meet the Press now. Stay with us. What they do is they say this stuff, and it's happening now with the January 6th. They say stuff, and they think you're going to believe it. It's a serious, it is a horrible, horrible thing. Welcome back. As we mentioned, we've been monitoring former President Trump's first remarks in Washington, D.C. since leaving office in January 2021. It has been in some ways a vintage Trump address with bombastic attacks on Democrats and aside on January 6th and even a suggestion to send in the National Guard to address crime in Chicago. It comes, as we noted earlier, after both President Biden and former Vice President Mike Pence delivered remarks criticizing Mr. Trump. Joining me now is Aisha Rasko, host of NPR weekend edition Sunday, Democratic strategist Adrian Elrod and former Republican congressman and MSNBC political analyst Carlos Corbello. Thanks to all of you for being here. Carlos, let me start with you and former President Trump. Not surprising he's attacking the January 6th committee. What do you make of him being back in Washington and this proxy war that really we've been focused on in Arizona now on display here in D.C.? Kristen, you really get the sense that the walls are closing in on Donald Trump mm. in his remarks. Even that clip you just showed, he doesn't mm. seem as energetic as he usually is. He seems a little hazy, a little bit confused. You know, have all these people, including family members, going to the committee, testifying against the lie that he's been telling for, uh, I don't know, uh, however long it's been now, seems like a decade, uh, you really get the sense that it's starting to take a toll on him. That plus poll numbers that show mm -hmm. his popularity declining. Around the Figures edges. like Ron DeSantis yeah. surging. I mean, it's not a good time for Donald Trump. Adrian, what do you make of President Biden and his strategy coming out and making these fiery remarks yesterday as he's recovering from COVID, mentioning the former president by name and January 6th. I mean, this is a break with the strategy that we have traditionally seen from this president. Yeah, I feel relief, Kristen, because the bottom line is this. The only way that Democrats are going to mitigate some of the losses that are inevitable for a party in power going into the midterms are to make that contrast and to draw that contrast. And who better to do that than the sitting president of the United States? Americans are outraged right now. A lot of Republicans are outraged right now. Seeing the January 6th pl hearings play out, learning some of the new information every day that we're learning, having some very credible witnesses come forward and explain what they saw firsthand during that 179 hour, hour period. People are frustrated and that you've got to draw that contrast if you're the sitting president. Otherwise, people are not going to know what the difference is between both parties. Aisha, weigh in on what the impact has actually been of January 6th, because obviously, as Carlos and Adrian are making the argument, it does seem to be having an impact. People are paying attention. But the question is, how much of an impact, right? I, I mean, I don't think we know the answer to that. Yeah. But I will say it is having an impact and that you have some Republicans very slowly, very quietly looking around like, well, maybe he's not the Teflon Don. Maybe mm. we can take him out. You got Ron DeSantis, you know, in these polls showing up a little bit. You got Pence, you know, saying we need to move on. Let's look to the future. I, right now, I don't think that you're seeing like a movement against Trump. You're just not going to see that. But I think people are seeing that he can take some hits and maybe, just maybe, this will do some damage. Yeah. Um, and of course, looming over all of this is whether he announces before the midterms a a lot of Republicans are jittery, are nervous that that's going to take away attention from the number one issue for voters, which is inflation. And this is a week, and Adrian, let me have you weigh in on this, where the economy is looming so large. We learned today that consumer confidence has dropped yet again. Uh, how much can Biden continue to try to turn the page and put the focus on his predecessor? Well, we're seeing such an unprecedented situation with the economy right now yeah. because a lot of people are, you know, feeling they've got a good job. They're very happy, happy in their job. The unemployment rate is low, but we're also seeing the effects of the pandemic play out with inflationary numbers, not just here, of course, but also globally through in other countries as well. So there is kind of that dichotomy. But I think this is what we want as Democrats for Donald Trump to announce today. Maybe he'll announce at this conference that he's at. We are ready to have that contrast. We haven't heard a lot from Donald Trump the last year and a half. This will remind people what it's really like to have a Republican like him 
running back and potentially back in office. Carlos, what are your sources inside the party telling you? Do you think he's going to announce before the midterms? Republicans are begging Donald Trump <laughs> not to do this. And the way they're trying to convince him is to show him that perhaps it's not in his self-interest. Because Donald Trump is, as usual, looking out for himself. He believes that running for president would be a good part of a legal defense strategy mm -hmm. if he needs one, which he might. And uh, Republicans are dreading this because they want the focus to be exclusively on inflation and the economy. And nothing could be a greater gift to especially House Democrats, but I think all Democrats, than Donald Trump announcing for president in September of this year. But Aisha, we've covered former President Trump convincing him uh, against doing <laughs> something that he wants to do wants to usually do doesn't different. go very well. And, and, and then, you know, look, if he announces and, you know, Republicans are likely to pick up, you know, in the midterms, he can say, look, I helped you guys. Look, look at me. Mm. I announced and look how great things are going. No, Republicans don't want that. But I think Trump wants the attention. And I think if you see more polls where it looks like he's slipping, I think you're going to see him want to come out because he wants to dominate. Yeah, and all of this, of course, taking place against the backdrop of the primaries as the midterms get closer. And you have Democrats who are engaging in this strategy in some states. We've talked about it, mm -hmm. of, of propping up the far-right candidates. We're seeing this play out in Michigan's race. I just referenced it. We didn't have the tape, but we do have the tape. Let's play a little bit of that ad from the DCC. John Gibbs is too conservative for West Michigan. Handpicked by Trump to run for Congress, Gibbs called Trump the greatest president and worked in Trump's administration with Ben Carson. Gibbs has promised to push that same conservative agenda in Congress. Now, in response to this ad, Representative Ruben Gallego said, quote, it's a choice between a far-right member of Congress or a moderate one. They're voting McCarthy as leader either way. So the question is... Adrian, I know you've said this is a strategy as old as time, mm -hmm. and that is true, but this is a very different backdrop. Does this strategy make you nervous? I mean, sure, there's some risk to it, but it doesn't change the fact that if you are, no matter which party you're running in to represent, you want to run against against the weakest party or the weakest candidate going into the general election. And that's exactly what the DNC, DCCC, party committees that are getting involved in these races, that's exactly what they're trying to do by propping up some of these crazy insurrectionist type of candidates because that's who we would rather have on the ballot um, going into the fall. So it's as simple as that. I, I do think that that is a very dangerous game, though, especially in this day and age where you do see a lot of the country that some of them might be cool with the insurrection. Mm. Some of them are cool with things that in the past would have been verbatim. So I think that when the, you know, when Democrats try to play this game and prop up these very kind of out there candidates, they run the risk that those out there candidates could end up in office. Yeah, there's, I was, yeah, yeah. there's a great dissonance between the work the January 6th committee is doing, sending a message to the country that this is a very serious, somber time for our democracy, that we have to put country first, party second, and then to be employing this strategy. It just seems hypocritical. It's not just dangerous. I mean, it should make people uncomfortable because literally they are propping up people who are advancing Donald Trump's lie. And, that is a dangerous game. And we're seeing it play out in Pennsylvania, as I was just talking about with Dave Wasserman, where Democrats did try to prop up Doug Mastriano, at least verbally, during the primary. And now, if you look at the polls, it, it looks like he has a potential chance of winning. Let me ask you about former Vice President Mike Pence, because his message has been very interesting. He's taking these subtle swipes at his former boss, saying, let's not focus on the past, let's focus on the future. Putting aside his chances in a primary race, we're really seeing this battle within the Republican Party, not between moderates, because Pence is not a moderate, he's a conservative, but between election deniers, right, and people who accept the results, Carlos. Kristen, you really get the sense that Pence feels some kind of moral obligation to not run for president to win, because I don't think he believes his chances are very good. Maybe he does, but I doubt it. I think he feels like he has to clear his name in a way, like he has to disassociate himself from this horrible thing Donald Trump did. And in his messaging and the way he's conducting himself, that's what's coming across to me. Say, hey, uh, what happened on January 6th was horrible. A lot of us excused Donald Trump's behavior for a long time. Maybe we got some good things done on policy, but 
Uh, I don't want to be associated with any of this. Adrian, final point as we watch a battle play out within the Democratic Party as well in these primaries. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I, I think Mike Pence in particular is trying to, to have it both ways. He's trying to say, oh, I'm going to support some of these candidates who, by the way, some of the people he's endorsed are still very extreme. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but at the same time, he's trying to separate himself from Trump and also trying to lean into Trump when it's convenient for him. So I'm not necessarily uh, buying it. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. Great discussion. Thank you so much, Aisha, Adrian, and Carlos. Really appreciate it. We do want to turn now to some overseas news. WNBA star Brittany Griner was back in a Russian courtroom this morning as her defense team argued she used medical cannabis to treat pain from injuries rather than for recreational use. Medical marijuana is illegal in Russia, but Griner has a medical card in Arizona where she plays for the WNBA's Phoenix Mercury. We expect Griner to return to court tomorrow when she may face cross-examination. Griner has been detained in Russia since February for carrying vape cartridges containing hashish oil. The U.S. government says she is being wrongfully detained. Griner already pleaded guilty in an effort to move her case along, hoping for a diplomatic resolution. In an interview you can see next hour, former Russian prisoner Trevor Reed told my colleague NBC's Hallie Jackson that he thinks diplomatic efforts from the White House to free Griner, as well as another prisoner, Paul Whelan, aren't moving fast enough. Reed was freed in a prisoner exchange with Russia in April. You can watch Trevor Reed's exclusive interview with Hallie right here on NBC News Now in the next hours. You don't want to miss it. And in other news out of Russia, Moscow announced this morning that it will pull out of the International Space Station in 2024, putting an end to a key symbol of international cooperation between Russia and the West. According to Russian media, the country's new space chief told Putin that the agency would now focus on building its own space station. The news comes just 11 days after Russia and the U.S. signed a deal allowing astronauts and cosmonauts to continue sharing flights to and from the space station. The first flight under that agreement is still expected to launch in September. After the break, it's one of the most progressive states in the country, but believe it or not, Vermont has never elected a woman to Congress. Why that's about to change next. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Every Tuesday in August, there are primary races we're watching, races that will set up some of the most important statewide contests this fall. Two weeks from now, the primary for Vermont's only House seat will set up a history-making moment in November. NBC's Julie Serkin has a look at two Democratic women vowing to bring a new kind of leadership to the Green Mountain State. Take a look. It's known for maple syrup, cheddar cheese, and Ben and & Jerry's ice cream. But this November, voters here are hoping to scoop Vermont's newest flavor and send a woman to Washington for the very first time. We are incredibly stuck in our ways when it comes to politics. We find something that we like and we stick with it to the end. And so it's, it's incredibly exciting, but it also weighs heavy on me knowing that a woman has never been sent to Washington from Vermont. The top contenders for the state's lone house seat two Democrats, 38-year-old Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray. Just wanted to say hello, service Vermont's Lieutenant Governor, running for Congress. A fourth-generation Vermonter who serves alongside popular Republican Governor Phil Scott and Becca Ballant, who entered politics for the first time in 2014. She now leads Vermont Senate. When I was growing up, I really didn't have role models for women in, in politics, so it is about representation. With the retirement of the nation's longest-serving sitting senator, Patrick Leahy, longtime Congressman Peter Welch is campaigning for a promotion, leaving both women vying for his old job, up for grabs for the first time in 16 years. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Your party oh, favorite. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Two weeks out from the primary, Gray and Ballant are hitting the stump. We're hoping to send the first woman to Washington yeah. from the state of Vermont. Reproductive rights, child care, paid leave. All of the, all of the for women. <laughs> Exactly. Nobody in my family had ever run for office. Like, not even, like, school board member or, you know, um, town meeting member. Any of those things. And now here you are. Yeah. So, like, that is kind of mind-blowing. You shouldn't be a millionaire or a billionaire or have political connections to run for office, especially not from a state like Vermont. The last election brought a record number of women to Washington. But they're still a minority, making up just 27 percent of Congress. Do you think that having a woman in this seat will make a difference rather than how it has been? I do. I think so. Why, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Why do you think it's so important 
for policies to be inclusive in that regard. So I think there's just an attitude of if it's not my problem, I, I just don't have to care about it as much, no matter how many times you can express to a man what it's like to be a mother, what it's like to try to raise a kid and have a job. It's just a different scenario. With experience abroad in human rights and in D.C. as an aide for Vermont's top lawmakers, Gray says she's ready for a new challenge, applying her lived experience to push for policies that are priorities for women voters. My mom got sick and went into the hospital. I was working a second job at night, mm -hmm. teaching law classes just to pay off my student loans and to afford rent. Mm -hmm. And I used my vacation days and my sick days trying to care for her and got to the point where I was going to have to decide whether or not to leave my job and care for my mom mm -hmm. or stay in my job and pay the bills. And that's the story of millions of American women. And when women leave the workforce, our economy suffers. In 2020, the same year Gray was elected as the state's fourth female lieutenant governor, Ballant became the first woman, an LGBTQ person, to serve as president of Vermont Hi. Senate. Nice to meet you, Becca. She secured a measure that would enshrine reproductive rights in Vermont's constitution, a key issue nationally after the Supreme Court overturned Roe. But in the end, only voters will decide which candidate will make history, a major milestone for one of the least diverse states in the nation. Fantastic reporting by Julie Serkin. We thank her for that. And we should note that Vermont's lone seat hasn't been held by a Republican since 1990, but the top candidates on that side of the aisle are also women, all but guaranteeing that this election will break Vermont's glass ceiling and end the state's streak as the only place in the country that has never elected a woman to Congress. History in the making, folks. Still to come, it's the economy. Consumer confidence drops for the third straight month. The Federal Reserve prepares to raise interest rates and the White House tackles recession fears. We'll dive into the week's biggest economic headlines next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. We're not gonna be in a recession. Well, the data just aren't consistent with a recession in the first half, you know, including where we are right now. Recession is a broad-based contraction that affects many sectors of the economy. We just don't have that. Welcome back. That was the president and members of his economic team downplaying fears of a recession. Today, we learned consumer confidence fell for the third straight month, falling to its weakest level since February of 2021. And just in the past couple of hours, we also learned Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will hold a news conference on Thursday. That's the same day GDP numbers could potentially show the economy shrinking for the second straight quarter. And all eyes will be on the Federal Reserve's meeting tomorrow, with the central bank expected to raise interest rates again as it tries to fight soaring inflation. With me now is Austin Goolsby, who served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under former President Obama. He's now a professor of economics at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. Thanks so much for being here on a busy Tuesday. Thank Appreciate you. it. I want to get your reaction to something that's been making waves, something that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told Chuck on Sunday. I want to play the bite and then get your reaction on the other side. This is not an economy that's in recession. But we're in a period of transition in which growth is slowing, and that's necessary and appropriate, and um, we need to be growing at a steady and sustainable pace. Do you agree with that assessment? I think I agree with that assessment. I saw it when, when it happened this weekend, and, and I'm an old friend with Secretary Yellen, uh, I should say, at the outset. All economists view that the determiner of what's a recession is the National Bureau of Economic Research. It's not the old rule of thumb that you have two quarters of negative GDP growth. Now, normally, that doesn't make any difference, because the main thing about a recession is it's a broad-based slowdown of the economy, not just growth. You see unemployment go up. You see incomes fall. You see industrial production fall. And I think the secretary's right to highlight it doesn't look like that. I mean, we added 372,000 jobs last month. That's, that's almost unparalleled. And that's certainly not consistent with the with the recession. But there's still a lot of risks in the economy. I mean, the, the Fed is raising interest rates as rapidly as they've been raised in many decades. 
So there is a chance that we, that we could go into recession by the end of the year. Well, I, and let me just be very clear with you on, on what you are looking for, what benchmarks you're looking for, because basically to break down your argument and what Secretary Yellen was saying over the weekend is that, look, this traditional definition of two quarters of a retraction do not necessarily apply to this economy because it's unique, because you have this robust job growth and because you need to take more factors into consideration. So what will you be looking for? How will you know if we are in a recession? Well, like I say, that's not actually a traditional definition. That's just a loose rule of thumb. And it's kind of like if somebody told you no dogs are allowed, if you got a cat on a leash, it doesn't make it a dog. But the, the challenge thing... is it's what most Americans point to when they think of a recession. So how do you deal with that Amy, messaging I mean, the... challenge? The, you never ask a messaging question to somebody with a PhD in economics, you're <laughs> going to get the wrong answer. But what I will say is recessions are broad based downturns in the economy. You look at several things, not just not just GDP growth. We had modest declines in GDP growth for two quarters. But the unemployment rate goes up in recessions. That That's what happens. People lose jobs. That's the overwhelming thing that's on people's mind when you're in a recession is we're we're losing our jobs. What are we going to do? And that's not happening. Now, that still could happen. I, I want to caution everybody. We shouldn't just take a frozen moment snapshot in time and say, is it a recession right now? Oh, well, then everything's fine, because the Fed is raising rates more rapidly than it has in decades. And more than two thirds of the the actual recessions in the U.S. have been caused by the Fed raising and, interest and, rates. And, and let me follow up with you on that, because we're expecting the Fed to raise rates again tomorrow. We're waiting to see by how much. What are you anticipating and what do you think the impact will be? I think the impact will be negative on the economy. Uh, and at the least, they're going to raise it three quarters of a point and they might raise it a full percentage point at one meeting. And when you're raising rates at that kind of speed, following on having raised rates at that kind of speed in the previous meetings, it's entirely possible that it slows down the housing market, that it slows down the automobile market and consumer spending so rapidly that we do have a recession. That's been the most common cause of recessions since World War II, since we've been keeping track, is the Fed raising interest rates faster than the economy can handle. So I don't want anybody to think that we're totally out of the woods, but I do think the secretary was perfectly accurate when she said, this is not what a recession looks like. Let me ask you about what the president said last July. A lot of people are pointing to this, that Americans shouldn't be overly concerned about inflation. He said, quote, our experts believe and the data shows that most of the price increases we've seen are expected to be temporary. That word temporary has come back a lot. Do you think the fact that the president said that has hurt his credibility with Americans now as he tries to downplay concerns of a recession? I think it did. I think any time you're a leading official and you get out and you say confidently X is not going to happen or X is going to happen and then you're wrong, it does undermine your ability to say that again. It's a little bit the, the crying wolf problem. And it's why I uh, I guess I find a little frustrating that we're going to have a big public argument about the definition of of a recession because the the economy is evolving. And five months from now, we could be in a very different place. We might be in a recession, or we might obviously not be in a recession. The economist in me says, what we should do is just sit and wait for three months, gather the data, and then we'll know. But of course, that's not on the political election timetable. And that's the reason why we're in this problem to begin with, All is right. they can't just sit and wait to figure out which it is. Well, a lot of economic data that we are still waiting for and anticipating this week. Thank you so much for joining us to help us understand it a little bit better. Austin Goolby, thank, thank you. you Goolby, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being with us this hour. Chuck, we'll be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.